watched uh, last night on PBS. Good morning. Good morning. Did you see that? <laughs> I'm glad y'all are here this morning. Um, 
I cranked up the heat when I got here for all you thin-blooded folks, and I'm going to need a block of dry ice up here for me so that, um, anyway. Uh, I'm glad to see y'all. Hope you enjoy our service today. We are now in the third Sunday of Lent, and um, it was misty when I left the house this morning, but I think the weather's a little clearer now. Hopefully we'll have a nice day. I do have some announcements to go over. First of all, uh, Debbie and Dave, well, well, Debbie will be directing and Dave will be singing in a Maundy Thursday cantata at the Woodstock Presbyterian Church on March the 28th. That's a Thursday and um, at 8 p.m. And you are cordially invited to come and enjoy the cantata. I'm sure it will be wonderful. And uh, yes. Make it clear, it's Debbie's directing and I'm one of many singers. Okay. Debbie's directing. Dave will be one of many singers. I will not be one of the singers, so it's safe to go. Um, anyway, uh, but I'm sure that that's going to be a wonderful program. Uh, also, next, that is next Sunday, the 10th of March. It's hard to believe it's March already. But we will have a, it's not really a council meeting, we'll have a church-wide meeting. Everybody is invited. We just want to bring everybody up to date on where we stand in a piece of business. We are in the process of looking at selling the parsonage, which this church has owned for a long time, but uh, it will help ensure the financial stability of our church and give us the means to handle any emergencies that might occur, but we don't want to make a, a move like that without making sure the whole church knows about it. Um, the trustees and I have been working on this for a little while, and um, so we're going to have a meeting just to bring everybody up to speed on that. Uh, let's see. The Must Ministry Jar is back there. We've been announcing the shredding event that Marietta is having on March the 9th. You'll find that in your bulletin. You'll also find in your bulletin a request to join us in prayer time for the church. Every day at 8 a.m. or at 8 p.m. or twice a day at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Uh, prayer works. It's a powerful tool, and uh, we can all benefit from knowing that we're praying together at a specific time. Uh, Holy Week, which is a couple of weeks away now, um, we will be having Palm Sunday on Sunday the 24th. And I will not be here. My good friend and one-time lay servant mentor, Joe Dabrowski, will be filling in for me on the 24th. And I know y'all will enjoy Joe, and he is looking forward to being here. That later that week, on Friday, we will have a Good Friday service. That's the 29th at 3.30 p.m., and I will be here for that. And so please come and help us with our Good Friday service. Uh, let's see, celebrations. Faye New has a birthday this week. Uh, Ella Baxter has a birthday this week. Debbie Boyd has a birthday this week. Are you gonna play happy birthday to yourself for us? So we have to sing a cappella? All right, everybody. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Debbie. Happy birthday to you. I'm hoping I would could forget about it. Uh huh. Y'all don't let me forget. We're not going to let you forget. Um, so you may have noticed something new. For the first time in a very long time, we have kneelers. And we are going to make use of them today. It is Communion Sunday, so we're going to do things a little bit different. Don't worry if you're not, if you're worried about being able to kneel and get back up afterwards, you don't have to kneel. They still are very functional. Um, 
We're gonna, I'm going to serve communion from behind the kneelers. When you come down, we will just go down the line and hand out the elements. We are also going to use individual cups of juice instead of the, the chalice that we have been using. Kind of mixing things up and doing a little old school traditional work here. Um, and if you would like, the kneelers, the, other than kneeling, the purpose of the kneelers is to encourage people to stay and, and pray or meditate on their communion experience. Feel free to stay at the kneelers to do that, or if you're more comfortable, you can sit in the front row and, and spend a moment praying, but we encourage that while we're experiencing communion this morning. For those of you who are still uncomfortable uh, with intention or, or, or whatnot, we still have the safety cups back there. You're more than welcome to grab one of those and do that when when we serve communion as well. We want everybody to be comfortable with that. So, I do want to say thank you to Marcos and his helpers for their work on the kneelers and getting those done. And um, I'm thrilled with them myself. And I, we all see a couple of hands. We have other announcements. Just a reminder everybody that the time goes forward this weekend. Did it's what? Three, four, the time is three, four. Uh, the time next weekend. Oh, it's daylight savings time next right. week. So we lose an hour of sleep. No. <laughs> okay. Daylight savings time next week. Spring forward, fall back, do nothing, whatever your preference is. Just be on time to church. Um, is that, both of you, that was the same announcement? Okay. All right. That's it for the announcements, I think. Um, so we are going to continue with our opening scripture this morning. First Corinthians chapter 1, 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews as for signs and Greeks desire, desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Beverly is a little under the weather. Uh, we hope that uh, she gets well and feels better soon. Our opening hymn is 294 in the Methodist hymnal. I love thy kingdom, Lord. We'll sing all five verses.
morning as we prepare for prayer, I'm going to start with our praise. Beverly had medical tests and the results came back excellent, so we want to praise God for that and uh, honor him for seeing Beverly through that and, and the test results, which were wonderful. And on the flip side of that, add Beverly to your prayer list because she wasn't feeling well this morning. I guess the test wore her out. Anyway, uh, keep Beverly in your prayers as well as the other people on our prayer list this morning. And uh, we will go over that real quick. We want to keep praying for Ron, uh, having some medical issues. Patrice Moncan, Hunter and Ann McAfee, Becky Newton. Cindy Franklin. We want to continue to pray for Alton Waits, Anne Marie and Dave, Amanda Schmidt, Bobby, Carol Fuller, Camilla Munoz, Caroline, Elizabeth Fagan, Faye New, Jean Smith, Graham Sykes, Jack Lamberson, Jean Kibler. Joan Hill, Logan Smith, Margaret Hughes, Marguerite Kaler, Margaret and Danny Simpson, Marlo Keith, Martha Childers, Phyllis McLean, Ray Tucker, Sandy, Sarah Polk, Victor Blackstone, Wendy Tedder, Willie Neal Kane, residents of Gaines Park, where we carry our ministry once a month, the unrest in Brazil, all of those who have been victims of natural disasters and violence that destroys homes and jobs, steals our loved ones. We want to pray for all of those who have been victims of those. I also want to add Reverend Terry Phillips and his family to our prayer list. Terry is a retired Methodist minister. I have served with him several times on Walk to Emmaus. The young lady who was killed on the campus of UGA a couple of weeks ago is Terry's granddaughter. So we want to pray for that family, that God will bring them strength and comfort as they mourn this terrible incident. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we find it hard sometimes to understand the struggles, the illness, the mental and emotional tragedies that we experience in this life. Sometimes it seems senseless. Sometimes it seems unjust. Sometimes it causes us to question or to lose our gratitude to you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Help us to remember that it is you who created all, that it is you whose breath gave us life, and that your wisdom and strength is far beyond anything that we can imagine. Restore our faith. Help us to cease questioning and accept our repentance for our many sins. We ask that you extend your hand and use your power, that you would heal all of those who've been named, all who are suffering from illness or tragedy. We ask that you bring strength and comfort in the face of disaster, that you bring love in the face of war, you bring forgiveness in the face of sin. We thank you for your wonderful grace that 
defies understanding. For the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came and gave us undeserved salvation by his teaching, his death, and his resurrection. We praise your holy name and ask you to strengthen our church and strengthen our hearts and open our minds and hearts to what you would have us do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would now read with me our statement of faith, you will find the Apostles' Creed in your bulletin. It can also be found at number 738 in the Methodist hymnal. Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
My scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John. John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. That's John 2, 13 through 22. Now the Jewish feast of Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple courts those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers sitting at tables. So he made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple courts with the sheep and the oxen. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, Take these things away from here. Do not make my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will devour me. So then the Jewish leaders responded, What sign can you show us since you are doing these things? Jesus replied, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Then the Jewish leader said to him, This temple has been under construction for 46 years. And are you going to raise it up in three days? <clears throat> but Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. So after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed in the scripture and the saying that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. So, how many of you remember everything that you were taught in high school? No hands? Well, I don't remember everything I was taught in high school either. Some of that knowledge never got into my ears. And some of the knowledge that got into my ears didn't stick for very long. <clears throat> and I'm afraid that there are many in our faith who consider the idea of Bible study a chore such as homework or studying for a test at school. I hope none of you feel that way. And if you do, I hope that by the time I'm done, you'll see that maybe you're looking at it wrong. <clears throat> if you are involved in a Bible study, and I certainly hope that you are, I would suggest to you that when you are reading Jesus' own words, that you go slow. And you should know that some Bibles have his words in red letters. That makes it pretty easy. Um, but either way, if you're reading what Jesus said rather than what people said about him, pay close attention to what he's saying. Read it slowly. Read it several times. And then ask yourself, what is Jesus trying to communicate here? What is the context or setting that Jesus is speaking about? Because sometimes when he's teaching, if you don't know the context, you can't understand the point that he's trying to make. Or he's making his point, whether you understand it or not. But the context a lot of times clears things up. How does this relate to today? Why is it important? And most importantly, what is Jesus saying directly to me here? Because if Jesus is speaking, there's a message to you personally in his words. I'm 
sure you have all heard the saying, when you get out of something, what you put into it. At the very least, that's true of Bible study. You can't get out of it what you need if you're not putting anything into it. But with scripture, it's even more so. I would say that with scripture, if you actually study it, you get more out of it than you put into it every single time. So if you put a lot of time into your Bible study, especially the words of Jesus, then you will experience miracles of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus was here to show us. One great exercise, I mentioned the red letter Bibles. I don't know how many of you have one. I know I've got one or two. A great exercise is to go through the New Testament and only read what's in red. Forget everything else. Just read what's in red. And see what you can find out that you didn't know about Jesus before. So as example of this, this, these miracles that we can experience through Scripture, I want to take a look at the two Scriptures that we've read this morning. The first one that Ron read is Paul teaching the Corinthians. The other is Jesus speaking to the authorities of the temple. Two completely different sets of people in two completely different countries from completely different cultures, completely different settings, and completely different topics, it would seem. And yet, I would say that those two scriptures are very intimately connected to each other. And I hope I can make that point. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul says that God will override or nullify the wisdom of this world. That those who hold themselves as experts and take pride in their personal intelligence won't find the kingdom of heaven. Only those who can be humble and understand that God's wisdom far surpasses any of our intelligence and our thinking in this world. Things that unbelievers consider foolishness are far more wise than our wisest worldly teachers. <clears throat> if you can't be humble and accept the gospel, you won't get the message. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, it says, The Lord said, Because these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is a human commandment learned by rote, so I will again do amazing things with this people. Shocking and amazing. The wisdom of their wives shall perish. And the discernment of the discerning shall be hidden. See, these people worship Jesus with their actions and their words, or worship God with their actions and their words. They weren't worshiping Him with their hearts, they didn't mean it. They were just going through the motions. And so they were deprived of the understanding and the wisdom of God's will. Here's an 
another expression I'm sure you've heard. I judge you by your actions, not your words. Like all real wisdom, the idea, that idea, is thousands of years old. I get dismayed, borderline upset, when I hear our teachers and our theologians talk about what a revolutionary message that Jesus taught. What a brand new concept that Jesus brought us. It's not true. It's so ridiculous it misses the point completely. What Jesus taught was the truth about the wisdom of God that people had been hearing and ignoring ever since creation. It wasn't new and revolutionary. God didn't suddenly become a different God with new ideas. In the history of mankind, we still weren't getting the message. Jesus came to teach us that message. And it was, what made Jesus special was not that his message was new or revolutionary, although it seemed that way to the people he was talking to because they had never gotten the message to begin with. But the amazing thing about Jesus, the thing that made his teaching so special, the thing that helped him understand God's wisdom better than everybody else, was because he had been a part of that wisdom since before creation. It was his wisdom. It always had been. This wasn't a new message. It was just somebody better than us teaching the same message so that we could finally understand it. So let's look at Jesus' actions with the money changers in the temple. The people were required by Jewish law to come to the temple for the major Jewish festivals. They had to come. And they had to present sacrifices that were without blemish. Doves, pigeons, sheep other livestock that they were to sacrifice to God to show their reverence. And these sacrifices, because they had to be good enough for God, had to be without blemish. So if you lived four or five hundred miles away from Jerusalem in Jesus' day, you had two ways to get to Jerusalem for these festivals that you were required to attend. You could walk or you could ride a horse or a camel or a donkey. That was it. So actually bringing this flawless livestock to Jerusalem with you was a little bit difficult, <laughs> shall we say. You know, not everybody was able to do that. So I'm sure that probably very quickly after the temple was rebuilt enough for them to make use of it, that somebody got the bright idea that to save the people from having to bring the livestock with them, they could just buy the livestock at the temple. Very innocent, hopeful idea. And since these people were coming from different countries and had different types of money, the idea that you would have the money changers to exchange their money for Jewish money so that they could buy the livestock. Again, very helpful, very innocent idea. And I'm sure that at first this was a great arrangement that worked really, really well. The problem is it was born out of the world's wisdom. It was the 
best thinking of men. Which is not good. Those in charge of the temple approved. Probably because they were getting kickbacks from the people selling the cattle and exchanging the money. The people selling the cattle would sometimes hide the flaws of the animals they were selling so that people would buy them even though they weren't worthy to be sacrificed. The money changers would shortchange the people when they exchanged Greek money or Roman money or, or Persian money for Jewish money. They would shortchange them. So there was graft and corruption going on at every level in the temple of God, God's holy place. Didn't start out that way, but like everything men do and everything men touch, it was only a matter of time before the corruption started. Man's wisdom, no matter how innocent and well thought out, became unholy in the number one place of holiness. And Jesus got mad. <laughs> Can you blame him? So here's another example of Jesus teaching the true meaning of God's wisdom. Not a new lesson. But one the people no longer understood because they relied on their own intelligence. This is from Psalm 51, written many years before Jesus was born. Certainly you do not want a sacrifice or else I would offer it. You do not desire a burnt sacrifice. The sacrifice God desires is a humble spirit. O oh God, a humble and repentant heart, you will not reject. Now that was written by King David roughly a thousand years before Jesus. Now hear Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 9. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said, those who are healthy don't need a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this saying means. I want mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, he uses the words of David. This is not a new idea. This is not revolutionary. It's the same thing David had said a thousand years before. God doesn't care about the sacrifice. He wants to us to have humble and loving hearts. That's what matters to God. So Jesus is actually living out the wisdom that David had talked about. He's living it. So if you take the time, and if you make the effort the words of Jesus will review, reveal truly amazing things to you. Amen? Amen? It's a wonderful thing. But it's not new wisdom. It's wisdom as old as God himself. It's just new to us the first time God opens our minds and our hearts to it. It's as old as God himself because Jesus was God with us, Emmanuel. Every Sunday, somewhere in one of my sermons, I try to share truths that Jesus has revealed to me. Not because I'm special. Not because I'm more deserving. But simply because I'm putting the time in 
with what Jesus taught. And I'm trying my best, not always succeeding, to do it with a humble heart. And to recognize that God's wisdom is better than my wisdom. And as much as I'd like to believe that I'm the smartest human being ever born, and I do like to believe that, I'm sure some of you have experienced that from me, in truth I know that I'm not. So it's not because I'm special, it's just because I'm doing the same things I'm asking you to do. Get in to scripture, get into the Bible, especially Jesus' words. Ask the questions. Who is Jesus saying this to and why? What does it mean? And what does it mean to me personally? This is the real miracle of scripture. This is why scripture must always be the foundation of our beliefs. The music changes. The churches change in appearance. The people in the churches change. But the foundation of our beliefs are in that Bible. So it's silly to be a Christian and not be spending time in that Bible. To kind of put the dot on that point, this is from Psalm 1. I'm sure you've heard this before. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. There is nothing more important to being a happy, productive, content person than spending time with God's word. Nothing. So if you don't do anything else to make this Easter special or different, to make this Easter a holy experience for yourself, start a personal Bible study if you don't already have one. Don't just read it. Dig into it. Ask the question. What's the setting? Why is Jesus saying this? Why is the Bible saying this? What's the history behind it? What did it mean to those people they were talking to? And what does it mean to me? If you need help with this, ask me. There's a lot of tools available to help you with this kind of stuff. You know, I hear people say, oh, well, I've tried reading the Bible. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't understand it. There's tools to help you. There really are. You know, there's tools out there that will help you understand what the words that they used 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago meant to us today. If you need help with it, talk to Otis. Otis likes to teach the Bible. Talk to me. Talk to each other. You know, study together if that's, you know, you should be doing that as well anyway. But there's plenty of ways to get this done and to improve your lives and to be happier on a day-to-day -day basis and to have a fulfilled, content life. Doesn't mean you won't have struggles. This world is full of struggles. But there's no better solution than a thorough understanding of God's wisdom, not man's, of Jesus' truths, 
not man's, of God's ways, not the world's. All that God really requires to reveal his truth to you is willingness and a humble heart. But those you got to have. It's just the way that it is. That is the canvas for God's artwork. Amen? All right. So we're going to proceed with Holy Communion this morning. And hopefully we'll get it right since we're doing things a little different this morning. serve Debbie first so that we don't uh, interrupt her.
I had two different people trying to tell me I had missed the liturgy for Holy Communion, and I still didn't get the message. That's okay. If the choir could come back up for our closing hymn. Thank you. 